Hey there, and welcome to Large Format Friday. I'm your host, Matt Marash, and if this is the first time you're stopping by, here's a playlist of all of our LFF episodes. And if you haven't subscribed yet, each and every Friday, there's gonna be a new upload with something different in the world of large format photography. You know, shooting a format that dates back to the very beginning of photography is quite a change of pace from what we've become accustomed to. A lot of the equipment that we need to make our cameras work is no longer made new, and the things that are made new can take longer than the buy it now, get it now culture has trained us for. That's why today, I'm gonna to focus mainly on the large format used equipment side of things. For a lot of us, myself included, used equipment makes up a large portion of my large format kit, sometimes even film. And if you're one of the many folks out there that are still assembling a large format kit or haven't yet begun the process, this can be one of the most frustrating barriers to entry in large format. My goal is to help you navigate the used market using all the tools that I've learned over the last several years. For those of you that don't know me outside the channel, I've actually been working at a mom and pop Photoshop for the last seven years. On the large format side of things, I've seen a lot of different pieces of gear, some really common, some super unique in all sorts of conditions. Being able to evaluate that gear in person is critical, but it's understandable that for a lot of folks, that is not something that is an option. There's fewer and fewer brick and mortar shops out there, and if you have to take your business online, you have to be even more vigilant about what you're getting and who you're getting it from. Let's start with the large format camera. When you're looking at large format cameras, for me, functionality is key. In checking the functionality of a camera, either in person or inspecting it online, we're looking for three main things. We're looking for missing parts, we're looking for functionality, movement, and we're looking for light leaks. I'm gonna use my 8x10 field camera here to illustrate the first two, missing parts and functionality. When I got this camera back in mid-2013, it actually didn't have all the parts. Um, some pieces had been replaced. You can see that brass knob there as well. Not brass, it's like a, a nickel color. It's, uh, it's not painted because that was a missing part. It was replaced. If you're looking at like an old field camera and you see a place that's just an empty threaded screw hole, chances are there's supposed to be something in that screw hole. And if you see something that's missing, if you can have the seller check and see if it has that full range of motion, or if you have the chance to inspect it in person, move all the knobs, check everything out. I'm not saying being, being an annoying customer, but at the same time, you wanna check and make sure this thing works. Another bit of functionality and movement that's important is to check the spring back. You wanna make sure this is nice and snappy, that the metal springs are all in place, and it's also a good time to check and see if it has a good, uh, good light trap. You wanna see if something that's supposed to come off comes off easily and locks back on, and this helps you check for any bumps or bruises that you might not like cosmetically or that might actually start to affect uh, the light tightness of the camera. So look for missing screws and start moving all the knobs around. The next big thing to check out for is light leaks. Now fortunately, this was a bellows that was brand new. It was replaced by the seller before I purchased it, so it's been great the last seven years, but I'm gonna show you a bellows that's not so great so you can kind of see what we're looking for in a leaky bellows. When you're inspecting a bellows, you can just use a tiny little LED light or one that's built into your smartphone flashlight. That should be fine. This one's a really high intensity LED so you guys can see uh, what's going on with this bellows when I stretch it out. I'm just sticking it inside the bellows and if there's any point at which we can start to see light poke through, see that, this bellows is no good. Obviously, if you see bits of the leatherette already coming off, that's not a good sign, but you just wanna run this all the way through the corners. Bellows are meant to extend, so you wanna check it at extension. If it's leaky while it's collapsed, you can bet it's gonna be really leaky when it's fully extended. So if you run into a camera like this, and it's gonna need to replace bellows, that can be a deal breaker if you don't have a repair shop or can readily find replacement bellows online. So just keep that in mind. On top of looking for leaks on the bellows, all bellows are attached to a camera, either to a piece that's on the camera or to a separate frame. This, this is a Cenar uh, auxiliary bellows, which is attached to this little plastic frame, which drops into the standard. Some cameras, it'll be attached directly to the standard, and if it is, you just wanna check that the adhesive is good on there that it's not flaking off or coming off. Again, this is something you don't want to come off in the field because then your camera is no longer light tight. 
You know, when you're really just in that mode to buy, it can be really easy to gloss over some of these little tidbits, but trust me, they're to your favor. Anytime you can point out something that affects the functionality of the camera, that's a bargaining chip on your side for getting a better price or just finishing the deal altogether. A lot of these things aren't deal breakers if you have the way to remedy them. Sometimes you can ask the seller to remedy those things before they sell. A lot of times a camera is not gonna be worth it. Somebody just wants to sell it quickly. So use it as a tool to offer less for the camera. Really, this is a two-way street. You wanna get the camera for as low a price as possible and the seller wants to sell the camera for as high a price as possible. If you give them reason to believe that your offer makes a little bit more sense because there's some bumps and bruises, so much the better. You're working your way towards that better deal. Now I'm not saying beat them up on every ding and scratch. A lot of this equipment can be really, really old, but let them know, hey, I wanted a functional camera. This doesn't look like it's gonna be functional. So here's what we need to do. Remember, a good seller will always be happy to sell you on the camera. They'll show you the finer points. And if you just ask the seller a question, especially when you're in person, a lot of times they'll show you what you need to be looking for on the camera. Over the years, I've only ever run into a handful of unscrupulous sellers that are either intentionally hiding something from you, but a lot of times it's just folks that don't know what they're selling. There's a lot of cameras that are sold through uh, estate sales and auctions. And when that happens, you can get a great deal, but you can also get a great deal of problems with that camera. So just be on the lookout for these things. Let's move on to the lens of the camera. Way back at the beginning of this series, I did a video on the different parts of a large format lens. Today, it's really just gonna be about condition of that lens, but some things here will sound familiar. Most large format lenses are gonna have a front group of elements. They're gonna have a rear group of elements. They're gonna have a shutter. And to hold that shutter onto a lens board, you'll also have a little retaining ring that sits behind the lens and shutter, or a flange, which kind of pushes everything out and mounts to the very front of that lens board. Now, if you already have a lens board, that's kind of an optional thing and not a deal breaker if it's missing one. But if you're getting a lens and a shutter, please, please make sure that it has that retaining ring. If you're missing that retaining ring, that can be a very expensive little piece of metal that you have to search auction sites for or have someone custom machine. Custom machining is always an option when we're dealing with uh, lenses and shutters, but that can get very expensive very quickly. When you're looking at a lens, the optics look good. We're looking for scratches, dust, internal dust. This lens has some coating issues on the inside of the barrel. So the inside of the barrel of this lens has like a black paint that starts to chip off over the years. Uh, they call the condition on Schneider lenses, Schneideritis. I've also seen it on Fuji and some Rodenstock lenses as well. Moving to the back, I've got a little Schneideritis. I've got some schmutz that's starting to form on the inside of the glass. If you start to see any little plaques or anything that ha looks like little spider webs that have maybe some weird colors to them, that might be mold. Mold actually doesn't grow on glass, but it grows on the coatings on the glass. And to remove that mold, well, you need to remove some of the coatings of those optics. Some folks are also turned off by scratches. Scratches on the front don't bother me too much anymore because you would have to do a lot, a lot, a lot of magnification and high f-stop work to even start to see the results of that. The rear element, you usually wanna keep that pretty clean. This is also a good time to inspect the barrel. I've had a lot of perfect looking lenses turn out to be not so perfect because there was a ding on the barrel of the lens, either on the front or the back. When you're inspecting those optics, having that little LED flashlight on you is also another good thing. We can shine our light through and start to see any stuff. Starting to get a little hazy in there, but nothing that looks like mold. Just give it a shine through both sides. That really, really helps. And once you've confirmed the optics are within what you consider good, you can go into the shutter. Now this is one that can be a real troublesome thing if you're shopping online for a large format lens, but it's always something you wanna ask the seller. Did they test the shutter? If they did test the shutter, did they just test it on one speed or did they test it on multiple speeds? Many large format shutters will have several different gears that are gonna control. So even if I have a fast shutter speed that works well, I might not have it working well at a slower shutter speed. So move it to quarter second, good. Move it to a full second. All right, that sounds pretty close. And if you haven't been used to like shutter sounds before, there are shutter testers that are available for purchase. Uh, there's even, I'm gonna throw a link down below. Ethan Moses has a video on how to build your own Arduino-based shutter tester. Pretty cool. If the shutter is having issues, 
This can be another hang up for some folks. If you don't want to send this lens immediately off to a repair facility, you want to make sure that shutter's in good shape. If you don't mind setting off that lens for repair, just know that it could be a couple months before it comes back from that CLA. There's fewer and fewer places and they don't all do all photographic shutters. And if you couldn't tell already from the less than super clean lens and kind of dinged up field camera, I don't really care too much about looks. As long as that lens camera or piece of gear I have functions the way I need it to, that's gonna be great. Looks can be very deceiving and you always want to do a mechanical check on these when possible. Now, if I sat here with you and went through every piece of large format gear that you could get used, we'd be here all day. I wanna cover one more piece of gear that's critical for almost every large format kit, and that's the film holders. Just like looking at cameras and lenses, you wanna check your film holders for functionality, missing parts, and light tightness. You wanna make sure it's gonna work for you. So your film holders, if it's a double dark slide, one that has two sides to it, you're gonna have two dark slides. You're gonna have this middle part portion of the holder with a divider in between, that's known as the septum. You're gonna have this little plastic flap at the top. This flap is your light uh, one of your light traps and light seals so you can load film into it. And then you're also gonna have on the front end here your light seals which will have a, a fabric or a felt in there to keep, uh, to keep the light out. So when you're inspecting film holders, first thing you wanna check is construction. Is this made out of wood? Is it made out of plastic? Is it one that's made out of all metal? These are good things to check. And when you're looking at it, are there any dings in it? Do the dark slides have any nicks or can you see through the dark slide if, if any of that's happening? Are they warped? If you leave these out in a hot car on a summer day, you can get wavy and warped dark slides and that's it. There's no way they're gonna hold light in. And replacing a dark slide, while not impossible, it can be really expensive. And again, you're waiting to get gear that's functioning. So just check all that. Make sure there's no nicks on the corners and that it's still light tight. On the holder itself, this little flap, you wanna check and see if the piece of tape along that edge is nice and clean. If it's starting to come off, you'll need to get some book binding tape and reapply that. You can also utilize that same flashlight that we've been using to inf inspect and just run it through and see if you can see that light shining through. So if, if, if you can see just an LED flashlight, you can bet the sun is gonna get in there when the dark slide's removed. This one has really good light seals. And if you have to replace that part of the film holder, that can be really, really troublesome. So I recommend if it doesn't pass the light seal test here or here, you might wanna move along on that film holder. Back to the construction really quick. If you do get a wooden film holder, wooden film holders are much, much older than metal and plastic holders. And not all wooden film holders in the four x five, five by seven and eight by 10 world conform to what are known as American National Standards Institute or ANSI standards. If you have a non-ANSI standard film holder, that means it might not fit in your camera. So the reason this is important in film holders is every film holder has the area that gets exposed. They also have this little lip. That's what locks into the spring back and prevents the camera from shimmying around. And all film holders also have what's known as a T distance. That's the distance that the light travels to the film plane. If that T distance is incorrect, what you focus on the ground glass and what hits the film are at different distances and you can see a softening of the image as a result. My two cents, get a modern plastic holder, Fidelity Elites, Lisco Regals. If you can, ooh, get the Toyos. Oh man, the Toyos are nice. Problem, they're still made new, so the price, it's pretty far up there. So once we know what we're looking for in a large format camera, where do we go to get this stuff? While I'm gonna try to not name specific marketplaces, I'm gonna break it down into different categories where we can get this gear. First up, we have brick and mortar shops. You know, brick and mortar shops, you are probably gonna pay a little bit more, but often not a lot more than you're paying on other online only stores and private forums. But the benefit here is a lot of these shops, because they wanna sell gear, they wanna be competitive, are often doing that qualifying that we just talked about for you. You can have somebody who's knowledgeable in it guide you through the camera. 
Some shops will even have the time to kind of demo the camera for you. So that's a great tool to have. I would recommend if there's a shop within a couple hours ride from where you're at one way, go for it. It's worth the trip. Next up, we have online only stores. Really similar to brick and mortar stores, online only shops will often specialize, they'll have a niche. So they might be large format specialty or film photography specialty. So they'll often do a lot of that qualifying stuff that we just talked about for you because they're not gonna have the same overhead of a physical store. They might have a slightly better price, but because there is that separation of the screen, you're gonna wanna do your homework and know what you're looking for. So, okay, is the shutter speed tested? How's the light tightness? Do you have any example pictures taken with the camera? These are some things that you can ask an online only seller. The next marketplace we have online are auction sites. By and far, the largest volume of gear and transactions taking place are on auction sites. And while it's not necessarily a bad thing, auction sites can have a lot of barriers in the way. There can be a language barrier, there can be a knowledge barrier. So maybe the person selling is just clearing out an estate and they sell hundreds or thousands of things online and they don't wanna take the time to look through it. So you're taking on risk when you do that. Price-wise, yeah, it's a really good way to gauge baseline prices. Uh, when you're looking at auction sites like eBay, you can always check the completed listings. So not what something's listed for now, but what something has sold for recently. This can also give you a baseline of price when you're shopping around other marketplaces. We have social media. The quickest turnaround I've seen on used large format gear happens in social media. Social media is an online marketplace, but it has a bit of a social aspect. So people will share these private groups back and forth, list gear, and if you're in the group, you're kind of a qualified person that's interested in that thing. You're not just some random buyer that may or may not know what they're looking for. I've had transactions go well over social media, pretty seamless and very similar to uh, the last category, which is private forums. Now at the beginning of this list, I said I wasn't gonna name names, but when it comes to private forums, there's really one big one out there that I recommend every person watching this video subscribes to, and that's the large format photography forum. They're the OG when it comes to large format online. That forum's been going for over 25 years. So you can go to largeformatphotography.com slash forums, and that's gonna take you to the large format photography forum. If you sign up now and you haven't already registered, you're gonna to have to wait 30 days to be able to see their buy, sell, trade section. But I'll argue it's worth it. Most of the gear that I've picked up that's been in great shape has been through the large format forum. There's a large base of qualified viewers and a little bit more than you'll even find on social media groups because large format's been around since before social media. This forum's been around since before social media. So it's a good one to go for general information, Q&A, image sharing, and buy, sell, trade. Now, on forums like this and on social media, there are resellers out there, and a lot of them are really good folks, and they will tell you exactly what they're about, what company they represent, and here's their price. I've bought some stuff from resellers uh, over forums, and I've had no problems whatsoever. But the cool thing about working on social media and forums is if you do have a bad transaction, or a bad experience, or just something rubbed you the wrong way, you can mention it to the rest of the community. There's a sense of community around it. So when you're a member of that in large format forum, below their buy sell, they have a review option. You can give advisories about a good transaction or a negative transaction. And this tends to weed uh, negative players from the community very, very quickly. Same thing on social media. You can, you can say, hey, this person didn't deliver me a product and write a review about it right away. It's unfortunate that that even does happen in the large format community. I find oftentimes a majority of folks, they just have good intentions and just want to move the gear into the hands of folks uh, that are willing to shoot it. Because let's face it, there are more large format pieces of equipment than there are people interested in it, but it's our job to kind of find, like connect the dots there, find the right people for it either online or in these shops. The single most useful tool we have when searching large format gear used is patience. That's right, that thing that seems nearly impossible when you really, really wanna buy something can actually get you the best deal on large format gear. A few years ago, I started the practice of journaling when I wanted a new piece of gear. I would create a little spreadsheet that had the date and time that I found a new piece of gear that I wanted to buy, 
And then I would journal when I found that gear finally online. So even if it was something that in my mind was super rare and nobody ever had, the longest I actually waited between wanting something and finding it online, the longest was two months. A lot of that gear I snapped up well before that two month mark, but if you can wait even a couple of weeks past that initial urge to buy something, you'll usually find, hey, do I really need this? Am I already making good pictures without that? Is this something I need to purchase or maybe I can just buy some more film? You'll get a better understanding of where things are in the market. Are prices up? Are prices down? And knowing that market better and having stepped back a little bit, you'll know when you see a good deal. If you're watching forums and auction sites and social media waiting for somebody to post something similar, you'll know exactly when it's time to buy that thing. In the words of my photography teacher from college, Professor Jeff, you can pay for things two different ways with money and with time. If you don't have a lot of one, you're gonna use a heck of a lot of the other to make that purchase. So if you need something really quick, you might have to pay a little bit more than somebody that can play the waiting game a little bit more. Ooh, all this talk about buying stuff is getting my inner hapless consumer all fired up. I better go outside and shoot something. That usually calms the urge for a little bit. Thanks for stopping by today. If you have any questions about navigating the used market or searching for used gear, just drop those down below in the comments. And if you have any really long form questions, remember you can email largeformatquestions at gmail.com and I try to get back to those within a couple of days. You guys have been sending great emails so far and are really informing me of what topics you wanna to see next. So stay tuned and we'll catch you next time for more LFF.